John, you, I think you should start since you're the, you're the family. Well, um, of course, your family too, but uh, just different, different way. Um, earliest memory of Joe for me, I think, is, although there are a few, but the one that immediately always comes to mind is um, I see us uh, in a little inflatable plastic uh, swimming pool in the backyard of our you know, parents' house. And I was, could, I was probably four years old, maybe five years old at the most. First of all, it seems extraordinary to me because he, Joe was a teenager. He was 13 years older than I was. So he was quite old uh, to be sitting in this tiny little kiddie pool with his uh, baby brother. Uh, so that in itself was extraordinary. But then the specific thing that has that touched me then and I've never forgotten is that uh, something must, some issue must have been going on with my nose uh, as, you know, happens with little, you know, baby kids. Uh, I don't know exactly what it was, but I remember distinctly the feel of Joe reaching with his bare hand, and here we are sitting in this little kiddie pool uh, in, in swimsuits, and uh, he, uh, he reached over with his hand and, um, I don't know, cleaned my nose somehow and wiped his hand on the grass and probably a splash in the pool or something. And um, it was just a, a tiny but uh, somehow touching and memorable thing that always stuck with me. And I can kind of see it and feel it, um, and it's um, it's a it's a warm, sweet memory, you know. It, That's lovely. Yeah. yeah, and it's so typical of him to uh, be generous toward people he loved, yeah, and people in general. But to don a swimsuit and get in a little tiny plastic <laughs> tub in the backyard <laughs> with Neighbors right on right around the corner there. Yeah. Uh, and then, yeah, yeah, that's very typical of him. He must have been about 17 or eight, 17 or 18 then. It was probably right yeah. not long before you, um, you both left uh, to go to New York. We were friends forever. And, oh, and then actually some months later, my mother uh, brought me a photograph that she had found in her collection of pictures. She said, oh, looky here. Here's a picture of you and your first, you were in the first grade. Here's your whole class. And I looked and there was Joe. <laughs> I said, that's, that's why I had this strange feeling about him mm. was I actually quote knew him, uh, which I didn't. But when Joe and I were, we attended the same elementary school. And uh, in the first grade, we were six years old. We were in the same class. And, uh, but I was there for just one year. And then I transferred to another school. And I didn't, uh, many years later, I completely forgot him um, and because he was so quiet and shy. And, uh, but when we were, I, we reconnected in high school. Uh, I guess I was about, we were about 16 years old. And my initial impression was that uh, he was a phenomenal person, I, I imagine, because his artwork was in all the hallways and and, and then also he was starring in class uh, dr dramatic roles. Oh. Well, later I learned that the guy in the dramatic roles was your, your brother, Jim. <laughs> and I, had, I had conflated the two of them and I thought, this guy is a genius. But it turns out he was anyway. And uh, I uh, wrote Joe a, 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 a Christmas card out of the blue. We didn't, hadn't reconnected. And... Uh, and after the Christmas holidays, I came up to him and, and told him I was going to start a little artistic literary magazine. Would he be the art editor? And he he paused for a moment and said, uh, yes. <laughs> and that was, that was the beginning of our friendship. <laughs> that was the beginning of our friendship. How uh, wonderful it was when, when he left high school and came east. I, I came east to go to, to university in New York, yeah, probably, and uh, Joe had a full full scholarship to the Dayton Ohio Art Institute. So he and I, he and I uh, came east on the train. We got off in Ohio. We found him a room 
We immediately got back on, we took a bus then actually to New York City where Joe spent a week and uh, going around to museums and went to a Broadway show and this and that and the Museum of Modern Art, the Metropolitan Museum. And, you know, the old saying, how are you going to keep him down on the farm once he's seen <laughs> Gabe? And uh, he, he went back to the uh, Art Institute in, in Dayton and he just found he couldn't stay there. It was too suffocating, mm -hmm. let's say. And, but they had given him a, a full scholarship and he was going to drop out after about two months. And uh, he went to the administration and said, I have to leave school. My father has cancer and I have to go back home and help with the family to make money for the family. Well, of course. And they said, oh, what? Yeah, he wouldn't have wanted to hurt their feelings. Exactly. He did not want to hurt their feelings. And that says a lot about Joe, yeah. that it's one thing not to want to hurt a person's feelings, but it's another thing to not want to hurt the feelings of an institution. <laughs> <laughs> he was excited by New York, scared by it, but also just with no money, he had to do things like go sell his own blood uh, to, to get $5 for a pint of blood, or I think it was. Yeah, well, and, that, and uh, Tulsa to New York with, I mean, you were going to college, so you had a, a, an institutional structure of some sort. Yeah. And Joe was yeah. just, boom. Uh, he was like born with talent, it seemed to me, uh, because he had very few art lessons were quite informal. And uh, also, I mean, you became an artist. Your brother Jim is an artist. Uh, I mean, and your father wanted to be an artist, but he circumstances yeah. didn't permit it. Um, but it seems to me there's something genetic going on in your family. But Joe really, and your sister Becky was a dancer, uh, there that watching Joe draw, for example, as I did many times, watching the, the pencil go across the paper, I got this chill because there was something magical about watching him draw. He, he just had that talent. It, it was uh, an incredible innate talent, yeah, because his draftsmanship and all of that was so amazing. And he really, as you said, he had very little professional training of any of any significant, you know. In 1961, uh, I had moved off campus to an apartment down in, in the West Village. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, in fact, James Baldwin had just left that building that I rented an apartment in. Anyway, <clears throat> I was lit sharing the apartment with Ted Berrigan. And then uh, our friend from Tulsa, Pat Patricia Mitchell, had come and joined the Tulsa gang. And we, the three of us were sharing this basement apartment in West Village. Joe was still over in the Lower East Side in a real dump, but which he tried to improve. Anyway, one night he appeared uh, at our door. We didn't have a phone. Uh, and he came in the apartment. And, and it was weird. Joe was actually drunk. I, I didn't. I, Joe wasn't like a, a, dr a drinker, really. But he had gone out to dinner alone, splurged on, you know, he had three dollars and he went out and he drank a bunch of margaritas or something and he appeared at our door drunk mm. and he came in and we said whoa hey and and he said just a minute and he went into the bathroom and closed the door <laughs> and uh we, time went by we went over to joe are you all right in there and we opened the door he was sitting in the bathtub totally green, green. he had bought some green food coloring and he poured it over his head and colored himself green. <laughs> he said, what the hell are you doing? He said, I just wanted to see what I look like green. That's <laughs> all. <laughs> and as we know, it's not easy being green. So that was, <laughs> he probably didn't re repeat that experience. But Another funny anecdote that sprang to mind was, well, funny to me, uh, was uh, one winter, uh, Kenwood Elmsley uh, had bought, uh, back in the 50s, had bought a uh, rural farmhouse with a lot of property oh, yeah. uh, around in the forest, really, a lot of woods here. Uh, uh, had been a sh uh, farm originally, but um, anyway, <clears throat> it was fairly primitive place. Uh, there was no, no telephone, for instance, and it was really off the beaten track, off a dirt road, off a dirt road, and nobody lived around here. And, uh, um, I say here because that's where I am right now. Yeah. Uh, but uh, they decided to come up for Christmas and New Year's. 
And uh, they drove up in Kenward's car and parked and started doing things. And uh, it came a huge snowstorm. Uh, and uh, they, the next morning they looked out and saw the car was just covered in huge deep snow. And so they, they panicked. They said, we've got to get out of here. We, we can't, you know, that we have no phone, et cetera. So they ran out <laughs> into the yard. They, they didn't have shovels. And so they began uh, scooping the snow away with frying pans. And, <laughs> and at that moment, they came driving up uh, uh, Ralph, who was Kenward's handyman and all around local. Remember Ralph. Um, Ralph drove up and saw these two guys out standing out in the snow with frying pans, trying to dig, dig themselves out of the snow with frying pans. <laughs> Uh, this anecdote got around this neighborhood very yeah. quickly. <laughs> Joe and Kidman became known as the guys who don't know how to use shovels, but they know how to use a frying well, pan. We're, yeah. He was no pushover. <laughs> but he would be from outside, outside influence. Or, I think he'd be uh, proud to, to hear you say that. He I think he'd be proud to hear you say that. <laughs> I think under the influence of his having his only friends in New York were writers, really, just Ted and me, yeah. uh, basically. <clears throat> and then later he, he met, became friends with Frank O'Hara yeah, and true. a lot of, I mentioned that, various guys. Yeah. He, he, he got to know huge numbers of writers, uh, uh, Ann Lauterbach, yeah. you know, and tons of people became his friends. But early on, he knew only uh, Ted and me. And, Ted and I were writing these, uh, this is early 1960s, very early, 60, 61, 62. We were writing pretty strange, let's say, experimental work. And Joe uh, uh, kind of got turned on by it and, and started writing himself, starting his own work. And uh, uh, it was amazing because from the first pieces he wrote, he was, he was already Joe. It was like children they keep uh, who are uh, parents are worried because they, they're trying to teach their children to read. The children get to be seven or eight years old. They can't read a word. Suddenly they pick up Shakespeare and start reading it aloud. I mean, those kind of things. Joe was like that in terms of writing. He just suddenly there he was. And he wrote this wonderful piece. And Ted uh, and I praised it to the skies and were stunned and a little bit jealous. And uh uh, then he wrote another terrific piece, and that started him off as a writer. And uh, and he was forever after that again his own person. Uh, he he, start, he was doing a lot of reading as well, uh, of a great variety of books. And uh, although he never thought of himself as a bookish person, intellectual person, not at all. Uh, and his spelling was bad, his phonetic spelling. So and he had I'm sure been discouraged as a, as a kid because of that. But uh, he became an absolutely wonderful writer. And, it, you know, he culminated in uh, his book, I Remember, sure. which, as you know, has become unbelievably uh, original. It's very, it's One of the, super original. How in the world did, you know, did a thousand other people not think of it? Exactly. <laughs> they <laughs> didn't, I know. Uh, and now the book has, I don't know how many, hundred, nine, seven or eight translations. Eight, eight, there's copies uh, in print and English. There got to be at least sixty thousand, and it's been translated into French, German, Italian, Spanish, Catalan, Korean, uh, Chinese, Japanese, uh, and recently Danish. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that book is uh, people around the world love that book. Uh, uh, as his friend Bill Berkson, the poet, once remarked, "You know, Ron." Joe is going to be a, a much more famous writer than you or me. <laughs> you know, who were the quote writers, you know? And uh, I think he's right. It's great. Uh, then, the Library of America published in this gorgeous. Oh, I'm going to hold it up here. No. I can do a commercial, right? Yeah. Is it okay to do a commercial? Why not? Here. This book called uh, The Collected Writings of Joe Raynor uh, with a wonderful introduction by Paul Oster who was a big fan of Joe's and uh, has been, was very helpful in getting Joe's work uh, republished. And uh, 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 there, there are certain people I'm in touch with, uh, young people who say, 
um, they write to me out of nowhere and say, I love Joe Brainer's writing. He's such a great writer, blah, blah, blah. And then I wrote back and said, do you know his art? And they say, no, I didn't know he was an artist too. And it, the other way around. Yeah. But when people connect Joe the artist and Joe the writer, then they see the full range of his brilliance and uh, his talent and, uh, and his ability to give pleasure both to the eyes and to the mind uh, through his art in the it, one hand and his writing. Isn't it the other. kind of extraordinary how similar, I mean, how similar, there's such a similarity between his art and his writing. In both, in both there's a simplicity, a humor, um, uh, a, a naivete, but, but maybe not. Uh, yeah. It's indefinable but it's just quintessentially Joe, I think in both cases, both in his writing and, and yeah. in his art, if you, you know, if you look at and read, um, read him, um, it's, it's just, he was, as you were saying before, he was always just quintessentially Joe. Yeah. What you said about his, <clears throat> his naivete or something, yeah. <clears throat> it was similar to naivete. <clears throat> Maybe it was naivete. Uh, but you talked about his uh, sim the simplicity and the humor. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the, if, you, if you read Joe's writing, <clears throat> the, and you come across those parts that are very simply written, but very, very subtle and witty, they're so sophisticated. That kind of art is so sophisticated. You can't fake that. Mm -hmm. Well, you can't fake it, but you can't do it really unless it's natural to you. And it's, it's not natural to very many people. Uh, and it was natural to, I guess, naturally. Well, it was not studied or learned on his part. It was just, I think Joe was just a, a natural in everything and had to be. I don't think he could do anything that wasn't natural, uh, first of all. And he, and he just had such an, an abundance of natural talents that... You know, he could draw on and did draw on, literally draw on sometimes. Uh, yeah. Uh, but yeah, it was all completely natural. I mean, it wasn't studied or, or, or learned, I think. It was, it was uh, yeah. pure Joe, pure Joe. Some people say that at a certain point, Joe just stopped making art. Yeah. And that is that. No, it's not true. Yeah. Not true. No. He, he, he did cut down on making art, but there's there, there sporadic uh, bursts of art making, uh, visual art making later on. Oh yeah. But but he wasn't pursuing it with the seven days a week, uh, nine to five uh, march that he uh, yeah. went through. He, he had a really serious work schedule for years and years. Oh, yeah. and, uh, and it was, you know, and it was long hours sometimes and, uh, you know, yeah. quite uh, close. But also he stopped partly because he, he became kind of disillusioned with the the uh, art world yeah. and the business the business side of it uh, because as he well, said he was interviewed time. by uh, People magazine I think in 1975 or six the art world has gotten too big uh, it's been too much money, too self important and too much about money yeah. and he was right uh, and uh, he just didn't want to have to put up with having shows and dealing with dealers and all that uh, but he continued to, to make some art and give away i mean joe gave away a huge amount of art uh to friends uh people would come to his studio or visit him and say oh that's very nice work there and just say oh would you like it take it i mean i mean as a maid people walked away with uh, some pieces they they prize to this very day uh, but uh, he um you know i think that although you could say that he more or less drifted he didn't drift away from the art world because he still went to openings by friends uh, uh, and uh, supportive. And oh, he was very supportive, and uh, he didn't look down upon anybody because they were still showing or anything. And, and but I think that, and this gets into murkier territory. But uh, and I don't want to make this sound pretentious either, because uh, I'm sincerely struggling with trying to to say it right. But I think that Joe's life at that point gradually became his mm -hmm. artwork. Yeah. That his way of living exemplified 
the kinds of things that had driven him to write and to make art. And just in his daily life became an artwork. I don't think he said, I'm going to do that. I think that's just what happened. Yeah, I think he did also. And, and I think he kind of refined it as it went along, too. He did, yeah. And he didn't let it, again, just like you were this writing his art, he was never content to just keep repeating yeah, exactly. his previous successes. Yeah. You know, he kept open. And uh, really, also, I think in a, in a certain sense, he had achieved a lot of the goals that he had had set himself out to do a lot of them it's uh, maybe maybe he felt he ultimately he wasn't as good a painter as as uh, goya or manet or de kooning or any of the paint the oil painters he admired so much but i think in many ways he had he had achieved a lot toward uh, uh doing what he had wanted to do yeah and uh so that why why keep doing it yeah Exactly. Uh, that, yeah, that's kind of what I was, I was alluding to before, and and you know, and I hope and I think that 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 kind of helped at the end um, of his life because he, I think, uh, you know, he he went out so gracefully and courageously as as you said earlier, uh, that uh, when when he. Found out, it, it, you know, he had AIDS, and and it was uh, he was near the end of his life, and he was just so brave about it. And to me, he said, "Well, I've I'm, I've really been lucky. I've you know I've done what he, he did, what he wanted to do, the way he wanted to do it." And I think that gave him, uh, I hope that gave him a kind of peace about um, passing and. As bad as something as horrible as it was to lose him, um, he, he really had, you know, <laughs> I'm thinking of Frank Sinatra of singing, you know, he did it his way. And, uh, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. I hope that was, yeah. uh, that was helped at the end. Yeah. And I, I, there was, there was no uh, bitterness about his life no. or, and he never, to me at least, expressed any regrets about this or grudges or anything negative. Uh, he was, uh, you know, <clears throat> one of the characteristics of his was his, like his, uh, he didn't want to have a lot of possessions. Mm, yeah. You know, he, had, he had his apartments, except when he was working, he, of course, he had lots of uh, artistic materials around it. But in terms of personal possessions, he had very few. No. I mean, for instance, he just had a mattress on the floor of his loft. Right. He didn't have a bed or anything. He didn't have big couches and furniture and this and decorations and uh, tons of clothes. And he didn't have a lot of material objects. He didn't want them. They encumbered him. Uh, he, he once told me that he, he actually wished he could live inside of a VW Van, a bus. <laughs> <laughs> that, that size a shame, I think. But, well, was, well, you know, and amongst his, the few possessions that he did have was this old magazine photograph that he had cut out of, I mean, it was probably a Life magazine or something, of Gandhi's final possessions. And, it, you know, off to the side was scribbled, you know, something to aspire to or something. something exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Was, That's what I was, you know, two pairs of sandals and a, and a bowl and a spoon and a, uh, an extra long pair of eyeglasses. Yeah, a pair of eyeglasses. And, I mean, yeah, he didn't get quite that monastic, but uh, but as you said, yeah, he was he was uh, simple. 